children and adults alike taking advantage of the darkness and letting loose. But would this pagan form of celebration make its way across the Atlantic to disrupt the sanctuary of the New World? Not if colonial Puritans had their way. The Puritan worldview was very much informed by the Bible. And in the Bible, you do find not only God, but the devil, demons, angels, the whole sort of spread of supernatural beings. This is really what they're focused on, pernicious, evil forces. For the Puritans of New England, the supernatural was a dark, menacing force, not a harmless superstition worthy of inspiring a holiday. Despite their efforts to kill the Halloween tradition before it took hold, there were a few Guy Fawkes celebrations that made their way to the shores of America. Other settlers tolerated or even embraced the traditions that threatened the Puritans. And seeds were planted for the holiday that would morph into our American Halloween. You find snippets here and there, people celebrating or having a costume party or something, but it's, it's very difficult to actually pin that to something we would call capital H Halloween. For example, there's an 1833 description of a Halloween, not even so much a party, but just a small gathering where they told ghost stories around a fire. But now, one more spooky standby. The image of a spirit or ghost would join witches and skeletons in a macabre Halloween dance. By the mid 19th century, America was primed for a much darker holiday. Having endured four long years of civil war that ended in 1865 with over a half million dead. There were so many unclaimed, unknown dead bodies that the Civil War left behind that this country was obsessed with death. And mostly it was that so many of these soldiers died unknown. We don't know what happened to them. So there was a huge sense of they could come back. Maybe they're not dead. It makes perfect sense that people would tell more ghost stories. And the very first Halloween ghost stories were about people coming back home. It's at this time that America's Halloween story really begins. After the Civil War, when Scots and Irish immigrants brought their rural old world Halloween customs with them, they helped to establish even more American Halloween traditions. For the Scots, it was a little bit of a scarier night. Until fairly late, we're still talking about the appearance of bogies on Halloween. Bogies, or boogeymen, were sort of amorphous, pestering ghosts that plagued children, hiding under beds or tapping on windows, or lurking by a gate or turnstile. There was a belief that there was a bogey on every style, which meant on Halloween night you could cross any gate and there might be something sitting there waiting to get you. Halloween's signature symbol, the jack-o'-lantern, also began as a European tradition. But the prototype wasn't carved from a pumpkin. There's a great legend about a character named Jack-o'-lantern. And Jack was a troublemaker, but he was so bad, he even managed to get himself thrown out of hell, which is not an easy thing to do. But the devil did decide to have pity on him and scooped up an ember from the fires of hell and gave it to him. So Jack takes the ember and he puts it inside a hollowed out turtle. And he walks around and that becomes the legend of Jack O'Lantern. In one age-old European practice, children would carve their own jack-o'-lanterns out of turnips and light them with candles. The first reference we have in the United States to jack-o'-lantern, it comes from Nathaniel Hawthorne, and he's writing in Twice Told Tales, and he's describing someone's very tattered coat full of holes, and when you hold it up to the light, it shines like a jack-o'-lantern would. Americans improved on the jack-o'-lantern tradition. They substituted big, round pumpkins for the old world's hard little turnips, and Halloween finally had its trademark. Certainly by the time of the Civil War, the expressive possibilities of uh, pumpkin carving were very well known. That ghostly, shrunken skull was the turnip in the old country, 
had really blossomed into uh, something else. Pumpkins are generally harvested around Halloween, and kids realized jack-o'-lanterns could be a prankster's best weapon on Halloween night. Kids figured out this great thing they could do. They could take a pumpkin and you could hollow it out and you put a candle on it. And then you take that pumpkin and you put it on a stick and you put a sheet over it. And you parade around, you put it in front of a window or something and it's really a pretty scary picture. Jack-o'-lanterns soon became the face of Halloween. But Scots and Irish immigrants also brought with them the more rambunctious, stone-throwing, prank-playing Halloween reveling to America. And on Halloween night, at the dawn of the 20th century, there was a whole dark world of trouble just waiting for American boys. Halloween had been on a dark and scary journey from its origins with the Celts centuries ago. In the Middle Ages, it became a Christian holiday honoring the dead. But by the 16th century, it was turning into a rowdy kids' celebration, marked by begging and pranks. By the 1800s, Halloween had even moved into cities and towns across America. But the ghastly face of Halloween was reimagined in gruesome shades of orange and black at the turn of the 20th century. For the first time, artists of the era brought together all things scary and linked them to Halloween. Skeletons and spider webs, jack-o'-lanterns and bats. They established the look of Halloween that we still use today. Among these icons are white sheeted ghosts. The sheet that a ghost wears derives from uh, the winding sheet, the shroud that corpses were traditionally wrapped in before burial. And jack-o'-lanterns. The big grin still connotes the rictus of a death's head, as does the triangular nose hole. And even when it seems kind of jolly, death is still, still lurking there in the imagery. Horned devils came from medieval depictions of Satan. And witches from witch hunting hysteria that swept through Europe and Puritan America. Witches became very popular in the early part of the 20th century, which is why they naturally became linked to Halloween. And there's actually a change in the way we perceive witches. The witches of uh, the 19th century were old, they had big noses and they were warts. And the witches in the 20th century are actually it's kind of attractive. It makes Halloween just a little, not only scary, but also a little naughty. But even as Halloween was dressing its old customs in new costumes, it was also creating new traditions, bad ones. Was Halloween in the early 20th century getting out of hand? To the dismay of authorities and property owners, the answer was yes. It was whatever you could think of. There was a bunch of mischief. Back in those days, people had buggies. The bigger kids tried to take a buggy and put it up on a haystack. And there's about a half a dozen of the guys, and they just kind of pushed and pushed it up the haystack. It was a lot of fun. Oh, we never did anything that was uh, really destructive. Mostly tricks. <laughs> But for others, those tricks were more destructive. Pranks, usually committed by adolescent boys, plagued cities like Chicago and Philadelphia. By the 1920s, Halloween in America was turning into a crisis. Tricks on Halloween night were out of hand. The destructive pranks went beyond just smashing pumpkins. Kids would take bars of soap and they'd put them in the rails for streetcars so that the streetcars would derail and people would actually get hurt. They would take the steps in front of people's doors and move them so when people walked outside, they would fall over and get hurt. They would set fires. They would throw stones through windows. I mean, this is really destructive stuff. In rural communities, pranksters took wagons apart and reassembled them on roofs. They removed gates on farm fences so that animals could escape. This particular prank was so popular that in some places, the night before Halloween was called gate night. In other cities, it was mischief night, or even hell night. Halloween pranks during the Great Depression may have been, in part, a product of the desperation of the time. 
an excuse for troublemaking. But there was already trouble everywhere, and many communities couldn't afford to feed their own, much less clean up destructive messes. The Halloween of 1933 was actually labeled Black Halloween in a lot of newspapers because of all of the destruction that the cities incurred. The kids were no longer just doing innocent, silly things. Now they were smashing light bulbs. They were setting fire to buildings. They were smashing car windows. If Halloween were to survive, it would have to change. Schools and police departments and other civic groups consciously and very actively promoted the idea of taming Halloween. And so they started to invent all sorts of things for kids to do, to divert them. Townwide parties, costume contests, games, everything that you could think of to get the kids away from pulling tricks and into the light. Novelty companies like Denison and Beistel helped out these civic efforts. Denison published a series of Halloween guides called Bogey Books that suggested ways of turning Halloween from a prank night into a party night. Denison was one of the first companies that realized there was money to be made off of Halloween. They started to put their own Halloween materials out for retail sale in drugstores all over America. They also made masks and paper costumes. This was a first. It was the first time that costumes were specifically made and marketed for Halloween. Before that, costumes had all been homemade. When I was a kid, it wasn't a Halloween outfits like you wear now. So basically, you wore your overalls or your jeans or sloppy clothes, but you didn't go downtown and buy a special outfit just for Halloween. Just anything, you know, to make yourself a little conspicuous. Paper costumes were fancy and an improvement on the homemade variety, but they had their drawbacks. Unfortunately, you know, a lot of that paper was flammable. And I was surprised at how many newspaper clippings I came across of costumes catching fire. Soon, other manufacturers looking to tap into the kid market for Halloween costumes began making more durable disguises. Sears' first box costumes came around 1930, and then it, it went from there. And the costumes came off of radio show characters and the funny papers. Costumes for parties, costumes for wild, town-wide parties, and for school parties and church parties. Halloween was a big social occasion. Halloween parades also helped drag the holiday out from the shadows and into the public arena. Allentown, Pennsylvania may have had the first parade in 1905, but others soon followed. Tom's River, New Jersey in 1919. Anoka, Minnesota in 1920. Anoka has held its parade every year since. In fact, the city now bills itself the Halloween capital of the world. Each of these local efforts to tame Halloween worked to some extent. But what Halloween really needed was a whole new tradition, and it would soon get one. But this new tradition would prove to be a variation on a very old Halloween theme. Trick or treat. That phrase still triggers cascades of candy into plastic pumpkins and pillowcases across America on the night of October 31st. And though the custom goes back centuries, the phrase trick or treat is probably less than a hundred years old. Trick or treat is amazingly new. People think trick or treat goes back for centuries and it doesn't. Trick or treat is actually less than 80 years old, probably. Um, the term derives from pranking that was very widespread and destructive in America in the 20th century. And at some point, somebody came up with the brilliant idea of buying off these pranksters. Homeowners bribed rowdy kids with homemade treats, such as popcorn balls and candy apples, to avoid getting pranked or tricked. 
1939, the phrase and the custom turned up in print. Doris Hudson Moss published an article.